have not um, uh, met me before. Um, the first uh, panel session is a conversation uh, and a sharing of perspectives as well as a dialogue with um, um, the audience on the issue of forging a common humanity civic responsibility. We've got four speakers and then we'll open the session to the floor. Just to remind the speakers, you've got 10 minutes and you will be um, given a signal when you've got five minutes left, I think mailing at the back there, and just gonna just do the time's up um, signal as well. The first I'd like to really invite um, um, the Reverend Canon Richard Tutin, General Secretary of the Queensland Churches together, and he'll be sharing with us his perspectives on being a model and inspiration to us all. Ladies and gentlemen, Reverend Canon Richard Tutin, please. Personally, 
that is baptised as an adult the same obligation to be nurtured by the local congregation and others is there. The aim of this nurture and subsequent teaching is to allow a person, whether they are a child or an adult, the opportunity to grow to become effective members of God's family. The best form of nurture, aside from specific teaching, is that of example, where the more experienced members model the behaviour that is expected of someone who wishes to be considered as a member of the Christian faith. What I have said in regard to the Christian faith, I believe applies to other faiths. So while we, as individual people of faith, might think think we are not role models or even regard ourselves as being capable of being role models, the fact is that we are by virtue role models because we have either promised or are keen to see people grow and develop in the faith and beliefs that we regard as important to the fabric of our lives. It is an important task and one that we neglect, I believe, at our peril. Being a model is not restricted to people who express a religious or spiritual way of life. It is exercised by everyone, no matter what their beliefs or understandings of life. Modelling is both the foundation and fabric of the societies from which we have come and where we currently find ourselves living. Without good and trustworthy models, we cannot exist and society cannot grow and prosper. Examples, laws, appropriate behaviour and care of others, to name a few, need to be passed on. Teaching through words and reading books and treatises can only do so much and take us so far. The message is not always retained. The most retained teachings and messages are the words, thoughts and actions of people who are seen by others as models or nurturers. This means that our lives are seen in a different light. We are not those striving to be models, as I've said before. We are striving to be authentic people, no matter what our faith or beliefs may be. This is an important role in life, and dare I say it, a great honour. It makes us stop and think as we make decisions and live our lives. It affects how we think and how we treat those around us, especially the members of our families. The late Harry Chapin wrote and recorded the song Cats in the Cradles way back in 1974. The song is told in the first person by a father who was too busy to spend time with his son. Though there are vague promises of spending time together in the future, these promises are rarely or never carried through. The main recurring line in the song is the son who models his behaviour on his father's example by saying, I'm going to be like you, Dad. Both father and son condone the missed baseball games and time that could be spent together to the point that when the son is in college, he too has places to go and people to see. All he wants is the key to the family car even though the father would like his son to spend time with him. In the end, the son grows up, moves away, and has his own family. The father, now much older, asks his son to come and see him, but the son's responsibilities and other activities prevent it. The son acknowledges that though though he cannot come and visit, it was nice talking to his father. The final words of the song are from the father who says, and I quote, And as I hung up the phone, it occurred to me, he'd grown up just like me. My boy was just like me. I've reflected a lot on this song over the years. It's in my personal music collection, and I've played it on radio at different times over the years. To me, it's a very salutary song and story. We often find out after the event the type of model we have become as a person. As I've said before, while we may not set out becoming models, we end up being them. While we don't regard ourselves as models, there are many others, known and unknown, who do regard us as models. 
we therefore need to be on our toes as we live our lives. What then about the second part of this talk, that of inspiration? As well as being regarded as models, can we be regarded as an inspiration to others? Again, the answer lies in the gift or the eyes of the beholder. Some may see us or others as inspirations. We do not, and I believe we cannot, set out in to intentionally to be an inspiration to all. It is something we may become. I'm reminded of the lovely story by Marjorie Williams, first published in 1922, titled The Velveteen Rabbit. The story's main character is a toy rabbit made of velveteen that becomes the favourite toy of a small boy. As time passes, the rabbit is eventually forgotten because the boy moves on to enjoy other, more elaborate toys. The rabbit is cancelled by the old skin horse, the wisest toy in the nursery, that if loved enough, toys can become real. It is, though, not something that can just happen. It is something, says the horse, you become. There are stories about people who have been and are an inspiration to others. What they have done or are doing has caught the imagination of those around them. Their intention in living their lives is to do something for others. In the process, their words and actions have become an inspiration that have spurred other people to follow their example and do something themselves. The work of Rosie Batty to prevent domestic violence in the community is but one example. and also offer stories and examples of people who have been both a model for me, as a Christian, the example and inspiration of Jesus instantly springs to mind. It is through the modelling and inspiration offered by others that we become the people of faith we are at present. We in turn become models and at times inspire others. Again, it is not something we set out specifically to achieve. It is something we become. This should bring us up short as we look at what we do and how we live our lives. Individual effort extends to communities, states and nations. This is an important consideration as, the civic dimension of for, uh, as we consider the civic dimension of forging a common humanity. There are thoughts and behaviours that we, as a community, appreciate, applaud, promote and reject. It is important to acknowledge that our communities can be and are both models and inspirations. And it is tragic when we find members of communities who feel alienated from the values and ideals that we as a community are trying to achieve. This can and has led to violent reactions and a desire to seek out people who can provide the modelling and inspiration that we as, in, as individuals and community have failed to become in the eyes of those who feel and are alienated. The main challenge before us is to make sure that we can provide the community that allows all members, not just some, to feel included and find models and inspirations that allows them to grow and become whole and happy and peaceful people. Being a model and inspiration seems like a lot of hard work. My experience, and that of many through the ages, is that it is hard and constant work. While it is more a becoming than an intentional process, being a model and an inspiration is a constant activity we cannot neglect. It affects every part of our being and the fabric of our society and our community. Our thoughts, language and actions are caught up in this pro process. Another dimension is our image. And I mean that in the nicest possible way. How we come across to people is as important as how we care for ourselves, our families, our friends and colleagues. If we are serious about forging a common humanity and see it as a civic responsibility, then becoming a model and perhaps an inspiration to others is something we cannot or should not neglect. After all, we have been inspired through the modelling example of those who have gone before us or who we still look for guidance to and support. 
In our own way, we pass on what we have received so that others may take and use what we have achieved. This is the way I believe that individuals and communities grow and prosper. Thank you. Thank you very much, Reverend. Uh, our next speaker will share a slightly different perspective, um, something that might interest some of us, um, especially in these times um, uh, with some of the incidents happening all around the world. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a uh, privilege to welcome Mr. Imran Tai, who's the assistant head of the Harmony Center in Singapore, which is a center that was set up by the Islamic Religious Council of Singapore, which is a department of the government, or a statutory board under the government, to actually facilitate Islam's uh, interface with and outreach to uh, other faith communities with regards to promoting understanding and, 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 and building relationships. It is, and he'll be talking about Islam and interfaith relationships. Ladies and gentlemen, can you welcome Mr. Imran Thai, mm -hmm. Islam. 
that is going against the very purpose of creation and it is against the will of God who intended his creation to be diverse. Secondly, diversity has a purpose. In the Quran it was mentioned, O mankind, we created you from a single pair of male and female and made you into nations and tribes that you may know each other, not that you may despise each other. Leave the Arafu to know each other and that has been, become the current call of the Hamlet Center in Singapore to push for interfaith relations, better interfaith relations. So, diversity ought to deepen our understanding, to erase generalizations and stereotypes. And in, in addition to that, the Quran also exhorted Muslims to strive and compete in doing good deeds, as mentioned in the verse I quoted earlier. Thirdly, Muslims must uphold the freedom of religion, and we often hear Muslims, particularly those living as minorities uh, in the West, for instance, asserting their right to freedom of belief, to be able to believe, to live as Muslims wherever they are. But too often, they are not also Muslims. I really appreciate this, this presentation that interfaith has to go along with intrafaith. The Quran states, La Ibrahim din, which means there is no compulsion in religion. Now, friends, what I've mentioned are three basic aspects of Muslims, uh, of how Muslims ought to relate with the other. To acknowledge diversity as divinely ordained, to deepen understanding and compete in doing good deeds, and to accord freedom of belief for all. Throughout history, we observe that Muslims did live according to, according to these values. Now, if you are familiar with John Locke, a 17th century philosopher who wrote a letter concerning toleration, which is now regarded as a, one of the founding texts of modern legal thought, it was clear where he got his inspiration from. In this treatise, he reflected on the absurdity that Calvinists and Armenians were free to practice their faith in a Muslim Ottoman Empire, but not in certain parts of Christian Europe at the time. And he said, would the Turks not silently stand by and laugh to see with what inhumane cruelty that Christians does rage against other Christians. Now, Voltaire, another important European Enlightenment thinker, highlighted the sociable and toler tolerant religion of Islam in contrast to the erratic intolerance of the Christian Church against rival Christian sects. That no Christian state allowed the presence of a mosque, but that the Ottoman, Ottoman state was filled with churches. Now, this was again in the period of the 17th century. Now, these examples are not incidental nor isolated. They have been a practice of Muslims for generations to accord tolerance and respect to people of other faiths based on the principles mentioned in the Quran. Maimonides, for instance, the 12th century uh, Jewish thinker, was leading and writing his influential works in the Muslim Mediterranean region, particularly in Andalusia or southern Spain and in Egypt, when Europe was persecuting the Jews. And when the Muslims first entered Brahmanabad, an ancient city now in West Pakistan, in 7108 AD, that brought the Sin region under the Umayyad rule, the Buddhist majority in Brahmanabad was accorded a status akin to the people of the book, that means like the Jews and the Christians, and their temples were to be protected and not destroyed, and they were free to practice their religion. Now, but of course, there were moments in Islamic history that were less than desirable, and Muslims must be honest about it. al wacharisi for, for instance, a 16th century jurist, wrote at length on the status of Muslims residing in non-Muslim lands, and he asserted that the need to migrate or hijrah to Muslim-controlled regions, or if a Muslim were to reside in non-Muslim land, they must not be in solidarity with the non-Muslim, and it's a duty to engage in jihad. For wacharisi in, uh, in the 16th century, the full expression of Islam requires political power or state support for Islamic law, a notion that we find today invoked by some of the Muslims. Similarly, Muslim extremists continue to invoke a 14th century fatwa by a Muslim thinker in Taymiya, a highly revered figure under the Wahhabi tradition of Islam, that declared the obligation of engaging in jihad against the infidels and killing them is permissible. In fact, this was the same fatwa that was invoked by bin Laden to perpetuate acts of terrorism by Al-Qaeda and their affiliates. The world, according to Wan Shalishi, as well as Ibn Taymiyyah and several other thinkers running from the medieval period to modern times, continue to divide the world between the effort of Islam or Darul Islam and the effort of war or Darul Haram. Now, friends, what we observe in Muslim history are two ways of engagement, really. One, an open and inclusive engagement marked by the desire to understand, 
to respect differences and to seek the common good. And second, between Muslims and non-Muslims, sorry, and second, and a more exclusivist and antagonistic engagement marked by a desire to divide Muslims and non-Muslims in order to dominate over the other and if given the chance to obliterate those who are to be regarded as infidels. It is easy to continue speaking of the first part, particularly in a place like today where there is basic agreement that religion must be a source of unity, not conflict. But I, I must stress that it is equal, equally important to deal with the second sort for they will continue to haunt us and to sow the seeds of conflict and to generate enmity. Now here's the key to understanding according to my opinion that these divergent responses of Muslims towards interreligious engagement uh, and the key is to understand the context. Context matters. Why do Muslims adopt a more open, inclusive and tolerant view of the other in some cases but an opposite view in other cases? Now it is important to remember one Sharisi, which I mentioned in the 16th century, he wrote it at a time when the Muslims had just lost their lands to the Christians in a series of attacks in southern Spain in Andalusia, known as the Reconquista. I think some of you studied history may remember this period. And Ibn Taymiyyah, another scholar that I mentioned just now, was responding to the Mongol attacks that pillaged, destroyed, and eventually crippled Muslim cities, uh, who, which were once held as beacons of civilization. This was the context. Thus, what we observe is plainly simple, that Muslims were contributing to the building of a shared human civilization at one junction in history. They translated ancient Greek languages and books and texts and philosophy. Persian also, Indian texts that allowed transmission of knowledge and new knowledge to be discovered. They did not shy away from interacting and learning from other civilizations and traditions. That cross-fertilization of ideas that had shaped Muslim civilization, particularly in the 8th and 9th century, in profound ways and propelled the advancement of science is able to be done because the Muslims at that time had a lot of self-confidence. What has happened since then? By the 13th and 14th century, Muslim civilization took a turn, began a slow process of decline, while Europe, much enriched by the products of science and learning from the Muslim world, began to rise and brought the onset of European revival through the Renaissance, the Enlightenment, and eventually the Industrial Revolution. By the 16th and 17th century, most Muslim lands were weakened, and eventually colonized. And under colonialism, Muslim self-confidence diminished as they suffered the fate of being told that they have no or no civilization and that the Europeans are now here to civilize them. While their resources and their labor were extracted uh, to enrich their colonial powers. Now it took another two centuries before we see the Muslim world begin initiating reform that led to a period of anti-colonial struggles and eventually the emergence of nationalism throughout the Muslim world. Now, today colonialism is of course dead, but the effects of it are still being felt, and the emergence of fundamentalist movements in the Muslim world is one major expression of this decolonization process. If the root of Muslim uh, problems is politics, then political struggle took center stage, and in the process, the politicization of religion becomes inevitable. This, unfortunately, is what we are seeing across many Muslim societies. It is a phenomenon that scholars call Islamism as a politicized religion rather than Islam as a faith and tradition of almost 2 billion people uh, worldwide today that have inspired many more. Groups like the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, for instance, or the Jamaat Islam in Pakistan, or the Islamic Party uh, of Malaysia PAS, or the AKP in Turkey, the Nanda Party in Tunisia, or PKS in Indonesia, these are all variations of Islamism some more radical than others, some perpetrate violence while some reject violence, which observers must distinguish from Islam per se. Polit politicized Islam is not Islam. They are an expression of wanting to reassert their place and confidence, which I see is a primary manifestation of a society living, still living under the effects of trauma of colonization. What is most unfortunate is that the struggle is often seen under the same binary view that has informed Bacharisi and also in Mutania, of seeing a sharp division which many Muslims continue to craft it under the misguided notion of Islam versus the West, or between the Jahilic society understood as everything that is un-Islamic versus everything that is Islamic. Now, the question is, and I will uh, end soon, 
How, number one, how can Muslims rise up from this historical baggage and view the world with more confidence to embrace the modern reality, to confidently interact and learn from the other, to be at ease with difference? And secondly, and I would like to pose this to all of us here, how can non-Muslims help in the process of building a new future for Muslims, of embracing them as part of humanity, of understanding their pain in the past and the present, and of speaking up for them, but not as them, but as we. This to me is the real work of interreligious dialogue and action. To build solidarity, not as us and them, but as we. This is the kind of work that, we, that will build the confidence in Muslims that they are no longer the objects of gazing, of constantly being humiliated and subjected to suspicion. Muslims must be brought to the table as equals, as contributors to society, as co-builders of the only civilization that we have today, the human civilization. But at the same time, and this has been my personal message to friends, Muslims can no longer afford not to engage in interfaith. They must grasp the moment, say with confidence that we are not superior, neither are we inferior to the other. We may have our own unique tradition and beliefs and practices that are different, but this is not for us to judge that we are superior than the other, than, that we alone possess God, the truth, and the afterlife. This was the mistake, according to Muslim tradition, that the bliss or the devil did when God asked him to bow before his wonderful creation of man. It is not because the bliss or the devil thought that it was unbefitting for him who was created from fire to bow before Adam who was created from earth. But Iblis' mistake, as the Quran affirmed, was because Iblis thought that he was better than Adam. That I am better than him, why should I bow down and respect Adam? This was the mistake of Iblis. It is this arrogance that prevents some Muslims from adopting an open attitude to engage with the other, to humble oneself, to listen, and to be open to incorporate whatever wisdom that we can find, even if it comes from people who are different from us. And I end by reminding everyone of a very beautiful uh, saying of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, who said that wisdom is the lost jewel of the believers. Wherever you find it, take it. Thank you very much, and I hope to learn from all of you. Thank you, man. Our third speaker um, was born in Israel, um, lived and raised and did a lot of activist work there. A uh, very inspiring young lady, and um, she'll be talking about like, sharing experiences in international peace work. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome Ms. Efrat Wolfson, the peace activist. Ladies and gentlemen, we welcome peace. Uh, it's, it's a real pleasure to be able to share this kind of stuff with 
for the general public and especially people who are so interested in interfaith work. Um, so I'm going to really breeze through this thing, uh, if I can manage to make it work. Um, just a few pictures from the reality in Israel class that I'm not going to talk about it. Um, okay. I have been involved for many years with a group called Windows for Peace, uh, or Windows Channels for Communication. It is a joint Palestinian-Israel organization that actually works um, with bringing people together, Palestinians and Israelis, especially youth, um, to have dialogue and conflict transformation processes. And um, when I say conflict transformation processes, and this is where I'm going to offer sort of practical tool number one, if you will. Um, I'm talking about actually dealing with the conflict, right? So I'm not talking about let's get together and play soccer, you know, or let's get together and share a meal. That's awesome and that's beautiful and that's part of the process. And there are many peace groups in Israel, Palestine, who do that kind of stuff. Um, so they get people together and they share a meal or they um, do a, a music together or they play soccer together. And it's, it's beautiful. I'm not putting down any of that work. I'm just saying, as a, for me, as, as a work philosophy in uh, interfaith work, I think it's important to go beyond that. And someone has said this yesterday as well. Um, it's that idea of, yes, we're all human beings, we can all love each other, um, and yes, we're also different. And yes, we also have a big conflict between our societies. And yes, we can actually handle that. We're, gonna, we're actually going to talk about the conflict. We're not just going to get together, see that we're all human beings, and go back home and feel all fluffy for five minutes and then forget all about it because there's a war, you know? Um, and the way that we go deeper is by actually dealing with the differences, dealing with the conflict. Um, and this is something that, to me, is really important as a, as a working, as an interface, working philosophy and, and practice, um, which I'm inviting, you know, dialogue about with you if you think differently, of course. Um, so that's a few pictures um, from, from the work that we've been doing. Um, oh gosh, this is long. So, okay, this is one I wanted to talk about. So, when we were doing this kind of work, um, the idea is to get people to start shifting in where they're at. Now, something really important I need to explain to you guys, maybe you don't know this, but Israelis and Palestinians generally don't meet each other. So, me, when I was, you know, a 15-year-old as a Jewish Israeli, I would never have met a 15-year-old or, or anyone Palestinian just, just in my everyday life. So we actually live a very segregated life. It's not like Israelis and Palestinians meet each other on the street. So this is a really huge thing because it's kind of like we have this enemy, but we don't actually know who they are. And they don't actually know who we are. So everything that I know about Palestinians would have come from the media, or from my family, or from my school, which will all be very, very negative images, right? So I will be growing up to fear the other person, and they will be growing up to fear me. But we would never have met each other. And I think this also probably happens here in Australia to some extent. In some communities, it seems like here in Toowoomba probably less than maybe in other communities, which is very exciting for me personally to find out about the amazing integrative kind of interesting work that is happening here. But in some areas of Australia, yeah, definitely, um, possibly people would have never met, you know, those scary Muslims or whatever, those people, that, or the boat people, you know. But we, don't, we haven't met them, we don't know who they are. So that's that first stage of just actually meeting someone from the other side of the wall, right? So, and the Israel Palestine is actually a wall, like this huge, great wall. This is actually a picture of the wall, sorry, I didn't step on it. Um, so meeting someone from the other side of the wall is step one, just actually seeing who these people are. Wow, yeah, they don't have horns. Wow, they're not so scary. Okay, 
Okay, now I can breathe. So our first step in, in getting these youth together, and this is a long-term process. So I, as a facilitator, would be meeting, uh, we would be meeting for about two years with the same group. And uh, the first step is building trust and getting to know the other person. Who is this scary person from the other side of the trust and actually being comfortable with each other but then the second and then the second step would be what I talked about before actually dealing with the conflict and we would use all kinds of tools to help and enable these young people to be able to work with the actual difficult situation and to do this and I'm talking now as facilitators of possible interface encounters maybe you guys it's really important for us facilitators to be really comfortable with conflict. And that's not an easy thing. That's not an easy thing. So it means rather than being really afraid of those moments where there's clashes, we could view these moments as like, wow, great. Now we're going deeper. Now we're, now we're, now we're doing the, the work. Now we're, we're doing the real thing. It took me a long time to get there, but, well, actually I had to do it pretty quickly, because, <laughs> so, you know, and this is Israeli and Palestinians, it's not polite, like, Aussie people, so, we'd have, like, people, you know, crying, and go out of the room, and, like, we're real emotional, some very emotional beings, <laughs> so, like, <laughs> thank you, so, yeah, um, you know, really, possibly really difficult, kind of, situation, right? And as a facilitator, you're sitting there, and there's all this emotion in the room, and you're like, okay, it's okay, it's all part of the process, it's all okay. You don't have to be so scared of those moments. You don't have to be so scared of the differences between us and of the conflict that actually exists between our society. Our society. They can, that, that is, for me, I think, uh, I believe, a real key in working through these conflicts and, and actually getting to a deep understanding of the other person, getting to a deep understanding of um, how are we going to share this future together as a, as a country, as two countries, you know, in our situation, whatever. Um, how is that actually going to happen? That's the only way to reach there. So the process that we would be working with these young people is moving from guilt and shame, this is mainly in the, in the Jewish-Israeli side, to taking responsibility. So it's like the Jewish-Israelis for the first time would be hearing what actually happens in the Palestinian torturers, which is shocking. Um, and they never hear about this on the media. So, on the Israeli media, that is, you guys hear more about what goes on in Palestinian territory than Israelis do. So, so the first reaction to that would be guilt and shame. Oh my God, my society is doing all these atrocities. Yet, you know, I'm feeling really shameful and what can I do about it? I can't do anything about it. But then, through this long-term process of two years, we actually moved into that place of responsibility. Okay, what can I do about it? Oh, I can do something about it. And moving into joint activism. And then, um, for mostly for the Palestinian side, moving from that idea of the victim, the, the passive victim, powerless victim, to a place of power. Actually, I have the power to do something. So for both of them getting to that place of, I have the power to do something about this, but from different angles. Um, so from passive to active, from indifference, not caring about what's going on, to empathy, really breathing through this guy, sorry. <coughs> from anger and fear um, and disconnection to connection, from blaming to understanding, from non-awareness to knowledge, because knowledge is a huge part of this. Um, the way we would do it, oh, okay, one little thing I want to say. 
And um, I think uh, Brother Imran said this before as well, the importance of each group working within our own society. Okay, and this is another important tool number two, if you will. <laughs> um, so it's kind of like we're talking about interfaith work, but for me, the, the, the way we used to do it, we had three groups, a group of um, uh, Jewish Israelis, a group of Palestinians who live in the occupied territories, and a group of Palestinians who are citizens of Israel. I don't know if that means anything to you, but I don't have time to explain what that means. Um, anyways, three different groups in our society. We had three facilitators. Every week, I would meet as a Jewish Israeli facilitator, I would meet with my group, the, the Jewish Israeli group. My Palestinian <coughs> colleagues would meet with their groups, respect, respectively. And so um, we would meet every week, every week, and do amazing and important work with it, just within our own society. Have nothing to do with the encounter with the other person. And then once in a few months we would meet in joint encounters. So, uh, and we would meet, wouldn't that more, but it, it's just um, technically very difficult to arrange this kind of encounter, actually. We need to get army permits and it's a crazy, crazy thing. Anyway, so, I actually view my job as those weekly meetings with the, with the Jewish group for me were just as important and sometimes even more important than the joint encounter. Okay, because in those, that thing I was talking about before, all of that, actually heaps of that happens in, within those uni-national meetings, within those um, meetings of each facilitator with, it, within our own society. We have so much work to do within our own society. And I'm talking about tools like communication tools and, and gaining more knowledge and understanding about our own society and our own place and looking within each person as well. So not just within the society, but looking each person within, within ourselves. You know, how can we talk about peace outside when we don't know ourselves? When we don't know each person, our own violence, our own inner violence even violence towards ourselves. So there's a, there are all kinds of tools that we would be using um, to do that. So last sort of thing, because we don't have time, uh, I'm going to go sleep. Okay, this thing. Last thing I'm going to say, I promise, sorry. Um, what we used to do with them is that they would write a joint Hebrew and Arabic magazine called Windows Magazine. Uh, which we would then distribute in schools around Israel and Palestine. And it's a, it's a magazine in Hebrew and Arabic. You can't quite see it, but everything is like twice. There's Hebrew, that's Arabic. Um, Arabic Hebrew. So um, that was, the magazine was both a tool for dialogue. So having a joint tool, important tool number three, having a, um, some kind of a joint mission, right? So we're not just meeting and talking and saying that we're all la 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 let's have dinner together. Great, awesome. Not putting that down, it's important. And also having a joint mission, something that we do together, something that we, we go out there and we can use it as activism. That gives them such an important sense of um, identity, sense of um, uh, how to say English. Like, like that mission, like that um, achievement of actually going out there and educating other young people just like them about the process that they have gone through. That is huge. That is huge. And some of these young people that I worked with like 10 years ago are now really active community leaders and activists in Israel and Palestine. And I'm so proud um, of that work because it, it touches people's lives in a really, really deep way. So I'm sorry I have to kind of rush, 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 rush through this, um, but now in Australia uh, what I do is I actually work with schools and communities on these kind of tools, on those um, tools that I was talking about, about looking inside and looking outside and communication tools and we do it through um, theatre and art and all kinds of awesome ways. If you want to talk about that with me later on, you're welcome to. Um, and thank you so much for listening. Thank you very for joining me. Thanks, my friend. And our uh, last speaker for this segment uh, is someone who's going to be speaking on the inclusive society. Please welcome Barry Sheehan, consultant and psychologist. Barry, please. Thank you, Brother Thank 
that, that little I have on here. Yep. Yep. Look, firstly, thanks to Hamlet and Buell and the organisers this forum um, for again providing yet another opportunity to talk about a really important topic. Um, and the topic is forging a common humanity, a civic responsibility. And secondly, can I too acknowledge Jerusalem owners of the land in which we meet, the Gaiwa and the Jawa people, um, and pay my respect to their elders past and present, but also emerging leaders, and also Kim and the other Indigenous people are here today. I acknowledge your presence. Um, when when Hannah asked me to do this talk some weeks ago, and I was generally sort of honoured and, um, and humbled, I, I suppose, and I said to Hanif, um, how long and what time? And he said, 15 minutes and about between 11 and 12. When I arrived this morning, went straight to the top, and this is what Maylene said. She said, Barry, you've got 10 minutes, and you're on between 10 and 11. After I covered from that, I deleted a lot of things from my talk. So if you don't like the talk, I've deleted the good stuff. <laughs> if you like the talk, I've deleted the bad stuff, and that's why I'm sticking to that story. Okay. So, thank you for that. Um, I was asked to focus this morning on the topic of inclusive society. And as I was pondering this question, I was continually, on what material what would be best to, up, best to cover, I was continually drawn to what I believe to be the cornerstone of the inclusive society. And a cornerstone in this context could be defined as something fundamentally important. I believe the cornerstone of inclusive society, what is fundamentally important to being an inclusive society, is compassion. We cannot be an inclusive society without being a compassionate society. We cannot be a compassionate society unless we as individuals are compassionate. So this morning, rather than taking a broad approach to inclusiveness, I want to focus on this thing called compassion. And so I'd like to take a little journey, if you will. A journey about compassion and bring it from the global level to the personal. I'm a psychologist and we like to individualise everything. One of the benefits of taking an individual approach is that the fundamental question becomes not what should the government do, not what should business do, not what should others do, but what can I do? What can I do in terms of compassion? And therefore, how, how can I contribute to making Toowoomba an inclusive community? We have to look within ourselves. The famous yoga teacher, BKS Iyengar, he said, yoga is a mirror to look at ourselves within. I would argue that compassion too is a mirror to look at ourselves within. As essential as it is across our traditions, as real as so many of us know it to be, the word compassion is sometimes, unfortunately, reduced to simply feeling sorry for. In some language, in fact, the word compassion is translated as pity. Compassion, however, is so much more than pity, so much more than feeling sorry for someone. When compassion enters the news, too often it comes in the form of feel-good feature pieces or stories about heroic people. Things that you and I could never really be like, or it's portrayed as happy endings or examples of self-sacrifice that would seem to be too good to be true most of the time. Our cultural imagination about compassion has been deadened by idealistic images. And so what I'd like to do this morning for the next few minutes is perform a linguistic resurrection. And I hope you'll come with me on my basic premise that words matter. That they shape the way we understand ourselves, the way we interpret the world, and the way we treat others. When Australia first considered genuine diversity, we adopted tolerance as the civic virtue. Now the word tolerance, if you look at the dictionary, connotes allowing, indulging, and enduring. Tolerance is not really a lived virtue. It's more a, a cerebral sense, a thing of the brain, the mind, the thought, a cognitive thing. I think we've come as far as we can with tolerance as a guiding image. I don't think that I can show you what tolerance looks like. But maybe, just maybe, I can show you what compassion looks like. Because it's visible. When we see it, we recognise it, and it changes the way we think about what is doable, what is possible. I don't know if these pictures exactly depict compassion, but I'm certain they show more than tolerance. We ask the question, is that the compulsion? We think about it, even if it's not. At least we 
think about it. Compassion is a worthy successor to tolerance. It's organic across our religious, spiritual, ethical traditions. And yet it transcends them. Compassion is a piece of vocabulary that can change as we truly let it sink into the standards which we hold ourselves and others. Into the standards we hold others accountable and ourselves accountable, both in our private and our civic spaces. So what is it three-dimensionally? What are the kindred component parts? What's in this universe of attendant virtues? To start simply, I want to say that compassion is kind. Now kindness might sound like a very mild word and it's prone to its own abundant cliches. But kindness is an everyday byproduct of all the great virtues. And it's the most edifying form of instant gratification. When one is kind, one feels immediately good. Compassion is also curious. Compassion cultivates and practices curiosity. Curiosity without assumptions. Curiosity is a breeding ground for compassion. If one is curious, one is genuinely interested in the other. One asks questions and is generally interested in response. There is genuine dialogue. Compassion can be synonymous with empathy. It can be joined with the hard work of forgiveness and reconciliation, but it can also express itself in a simple act of presence. It's linked to practical virtues like generosity and hospitality and just being there, just showing up. <coughs> now here's a space from the 20th century um, that, we might surpri- that might surprise us all in a discussion about compassion. Obviously it's Albert Einstein. Now we all know about Albert Einstein and came with E equals MC squared and relativity, etc., but we don't hear so much about the Einstein who invited the African-American opera singer Marion Anderson to stay at his home when she came to sing in Princeton because the best hotel there was segregated, segregated and it wouldn't happen. We don't hear about Einstein who used his celebrity to advocate political prisoners in Europe or the Scotsboro Boys in the American South. Einstein believed deeply that science should, science should transcend national and ethnic divisions. But in what physicists and chemists become the purveyors of weapons of mass destruction in the early 20th century, he said once that science in his generation had become like a razor blade in the hands of a three-year-old. And Einstein foresaw that as we grow more modern and technologically advanced, we need the virtues our traditions carry forward in more time, not less time. He liked to talk about those who referred to as the spiritual geniuses of our ages. Some of his favourites were Moses, Jesus, Gandhi, Buddha, Sir Francis of Assisi. And Einstein said that these kinds of geniuses in the, art, in the art of loving and the art of living are more necessary to the dignity, security and joy of humility than the discoverers of objective knowledge. Now, invoking Einstein might not seem the best way to bring compassion down to earth and make it seem accessible to all the rest of us. But actually it is. Einstein became a humanitarian not because of his exquisite knowledge of space and time and matter, but because he was a Jew as Germany grew fascist. I might, I know we're running out of time, so I might just go to the, the question marks, uh, Maylene, those question mark slides. Look, I, I said at the beginning that I didn't want to sort of, um, I didn't want to focus on the individual. I wanted to focus on the individual rather than the broader societal factors. I do, however, I just want to finish with some questions. If compassion is so good for us, do we train our children in compassion? And if not, why not? Do we model it for them? Do we educate them in compassion? If compassion is so good for us, why don't we vote for people in our government at all levels based on compassion? So that we can have a more caring world. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, forging a common humanity is a civic responsibility. And yes, we do need to be an inclusive society. It starts with compassion. Thanks, Mary. Well said. Um, I'd like to now uh, open the discussion of the, 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 the segment to the floor uh, in having this say and also in engaging the uh, speakers. So may I have the four speakers up on stage, please, um, if there were questions directed at them or comments made that they might want to respond to, uh, please, thank you.
Now, while you're doing that, I would also encourage um, some of us who have already been um, thinking about questions to ask Venerable uh, Jin Kung to actually write them down. We've been getting a couple more. Uh, we could do with a lot more. So if you have a question already, please do write it down and um, hand it over to Mei Ling, who is somewhere at the back there. Oh, she's here with me here. <laughs> Great. So um, I guess we have a microphone over there, and if you have a question or a comment, please raise your hand. The microphone, Rachel, over there. Thank you. Thank you. Rachel, and then the gentleman in the middle. Thank you. We do have slightly more than 15 minutes, but the transmission needs to start at 11 o'clock. Rachel, thank you. Well, 
uh, and it, it enriches it and it gives that depth that you wouldn't get if it was an academic exercise or an intellectual exercise, which is but it's not. So thank you, Yes. Uh, my name is Klaus Moritz. My name is Klaus Moretz. I heard Mary here saying uh, uh, compassion and tolerance. <coughs> what came into my mind is tolerance is uh, I have no objections for the uh, uh, Islamic people, the refugees, for instance, to come into Australia. But compassion came into my mind is when I open my door and my home and let them have a sleep and let them stay there until they find a real home. That's what popped up into my mind. Another question is, Barry, if I have compassion, which I have, what's wrong with me? <laughs> empathy. Is empathy an acknowledgement of the other person? Or is, uh, and the compassion doesn't mean it's an act of love? Because when I have conversion, with, when I converse with people, they say to me, oh, you have empathy. English is not my first language. It's a foreign language to me. So I don't quite comprehend empathy and compassion. What's the difference? Thank you for the question. There's a lot of complex questions there. Um, um, can I say the, um, the, the first thing? Well, I don't know if there's anything wrong with your psychology. If you want to make a point, I'll have to have a session with you. But I don't think there's anything wrong with you because you've got compassion. Uh, I, obviously, and for me, Empathy is a subset of compassion. I mean, empathy is linking with the other people and feeling with that person. And compassion is doing more. Um, and compassion is, is absolutely being there and dialoguing with them. And, being, and when you're compassionate, it doesn't have to be a problem. The person doesn't have to be hurting or anything. You're just with them. You understand them. You're, it's, it's a higher level of empathy. And I think it's more about doing. Um, that's probably the, the short answer I do. But it's a, we can we have a 20-minute discussion just on that. Um, there was a third part of your question too, I think. I can't remember what it was. Maybe, maybe I'll cut it off. But I'm having other ones on my comments too. Don't worry. Uh, right, I'm, I'm going to take three more questions from then. Uh, we'll give you a couple of questions. You can bring up a hand and then the gentleman up front here and Mr. Russell. Yeah. Yeah. So if you take three, if there's time, I'll take you. Yeah.
to have a room where we, I can facilitate for those who would like to come some discussion groups on compassion and self-development, which I hope Barry would come to as well. Professionally, I'm a psych and general trained nurse and a counsellor. Um, and yogically, I'm Swami Karunamurti. So I have many skills to offer. Um, if those who would like to take part, fair enough. What do you think, Barry? Yeah, look, I, I don't disagree at all. I, I think I agree with a lot of what you said. Um, a, a couple of things, um, a couple of things I deleted in my talk. One of the things was there was a um, um, the father of a emotional intelligence, I'm trying to think of his name, um, can't think of it, doesn't matter. He talked about a study, um, yeah, Goldman, Goldman. He talked about a study done in a theological sort of seminary some years ago where half the students, but they were all told they had to do it, they were trained to be part of they were, all to, they were all told they had to do a sort of a, a sermon, right? Tell us a practice. Half of them were, give the, were given the Good Samaritan sort of talk about, it. Um, and the other half were just given random ones. Then they had to leave the building and go to another building to do it. As they walked the building, there was a, a man lying down moaning, obviously in uh, in pain and in need and so forth. Now the question is, did they stop? Um, did they stop to help? The more important question is, did those that were reading about the Good Samaritan parable stop all? The answer is no. What determined whether they stopped or not was how busy they were. If they weren't busy, um, they tended to sort of, um, they tended to stop. If they were busy, they walked straight past. And I think that's what happens in us. All of us in life, we get so busy we don't always reach out. The second thing I wanted to say is this whole concept of getting into the self. If, if I put it in spiritual terms, why don't I have a relationship with God? Um, my high power, as I understand him, um, I can't possibly do that as I have a relationship with other people. I can't possibly have a relationship with other people as I have a relationship with myself. Um, and I think the starting point is the self. Look at those things inside. Even your passion, your own self-compassion. But you also have to look at sort of, um, I don't think you'd be compassionate unless you have self-compassion too. And you understand yourself and your friendships and all the rest of the thing. Thank you very much. Thank you for that very generous offer. Can we affirm that generosity? Firstly, I would like to thank each of the speakers because I found each and every one of you incredibly enlightening. And to put it in simple terms, for me, you know, I, I see you as a wonderful representative of a community that's come together to try and solve the problem, not a government solution, but, but certainly as an individual community trying to do that, which is fantastic. Um, a wonderful representation of, from, from the churches, the, the faith groups, and things like that. Um, wonderful to see government actually trying to educate. The community. So I, I saw your role in this government as being fantastic. So Barry, of course, is a professional, uh, providing probably an academic knowledge as well. So as a group, it's fantastic. But the one thing I, I think is lacking is where, where, where is the seat for a member of the media who probably have the biggest responsibility within any community to get the information out? Uh, that was a great example of. You know, when you don't see the problems that have been caused because all you hear is on the particular media. Um, I've only recently, uh, in the last two years, been involved in Moses, so I'm now getting to see first hand the difficulties within our own communities uh, about lack of compassion and those sorts of things, and it's, it's educated me. Before that, I thought I was highly intelligent, highly trained, um, highly skilled, highly knowledgeable, um, and I thought the world was an awful place. But I've now learned that there are compassionate people, knowledgeable people, people like everybody in here doing things about it. But that's because it's been put in front of my face with the work that I've done in the last two years. Until we get the media, not just reporting on events like this, but being part of the discussion and taking responsibility for their work, then I think we'll all struggle to get the message out there about being compassionate, about what's really important as a community. So I guess my question is to all of you, how do you see bringing, especially in a place like Australia where the media has so much control, or sorry, lack of control, how, how do we, we make that happen? I think the media in Australia is finding its way too. 
because of what Belinda was talking about yesterday when she was talking about alternative societies and the use of social media. I mean, what are we talking about when we talk about media is the biggest question that we can answer. And um, the mainstream media, print, um, broadcast, etc., is really trying to find its way in a very, very ever-changing world. Um, so it's got to get our attention. Unfortunately, the way it gets our attention is by putting up the most, the worst-case scenarios in every situation. And perhaps it's groups like us, because it all starts with us, as you rightly said, all um, asking uh, and, and calling for the media for a more perhaps balanced way. But the only way we can do that is to produce the news that is balanced. So it's really up to us to produce the stories that the media can take hold of. And, um, and, and that in itself can be a, a difficult exercise. I know people have tried it before, but it is really the only way. We are the story producers. Uh, the media just reacts to what we do, and if we can really get organised to do that, that would be great. Yeah. Um, I don't just work on issues of interreligious issues in Singapore, but also in the region, particularly in Indonesia. And there's one takeaway that I get from that. You know, in, in, two, in the year around 2000, when a series of uh, interreligious conflict between the Muslims and the Christians occurred in eastern Indonesia, in Maluku and Ambon, and the surrounding islands, a lot of it was fueled also by inaccuracies, inaccurate statements, and also by rumors in particular. And journalists who come from other parts of Indonesia who doesn't understand what is really going on, they tend to look at the surface level because uh, they see the outward expression that this is Christians versus Muslims. Whereas it's a, a lot more complex, where it's about land ownership, it's about resources, it's about military intervention, and a lot of other things which only activists who are working on the ground will be able to surface it up and be able to actually grasp what is actually going on. And some of the activists in Maluku and Ambon, what they did was they latched onto social media and they called themselves peace provocateurs in order to combat the kind of misinformation that media was peddling, as well as rumors that goes from word of mouth through the villages. So the moment they hear a rumor, they will engage all these youngsters who are plugged onto social media to immediately tweet, Facebook, whatever that they have on, to dispel those rumors and to tell them, do not be afraid, stay at your home, there is nothing going on, just keep calm and move on. I think that kind of uh, uh, framework we can adopt, I'm not sure about, about um, uh, Australia, but in Singapore, for instance, the uh, IRCC, or Interreligious and Racial Confidence Circle, has that kind of framework also. So if something were to happen between a Muslim and, uh, 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 let's say, a Hindu, yeah, there was a castle or something, and then words start to spread that it's a Hindu-Muslim conflict, there will be leaders on the ground ready to tell their flock, no, this is not what's going on, and they dispel the rumor immediately before it blew out of proportion. So maybe you might want to think of some framework, or already there, there's one in Australia, I'm not sure. Thank you. Thank you very much.